Hello, everyone, and welcome to Desserts with the Folgar Sisters. I'm your host, Chess Grandmaster Yasser Serwan. A short while ago, Judith Folgar approached me and said, could you help me with something, Yasser? And when the greatest female chess player of all times asks you for help, your only answer is, how? She said, I would like you to host a discussion, an interview, uh, with me and my sisters. I said, you want me to talk? She said, yes. I said, well, I can do that. I can talk. So that was how the idea was born. And as I started thinking about it, I thought, well, in these times, I really have a rather monotonous day. I want to do something a little different. I want to get dressed up. I want to look good for the Polgar sisters. And I thought, well, I've known them since 1988, holy smokes, a lifetime ago, and we haven't really had such an opportunity to get together and all talk together. So this was, I wanted it to be really special. So I asked if it was okay, if everybody get dressed up and really, really nice. And I didn't want the show, the interview to be an interrogation. So I said, okay, what we've got to do is we've all got to make our own desserts. And since I'm living in Holland, well, it was very easy for me. Dutch apple pie. Yes, with cinnamon sauce. Very, very nice. And all the ladies are going to cook their own. They have cooked their own dessert. And now it's time to introduce them first. Hello, Susan. Nice to see you. Hi, it's so nice to see you, Yasser. I know we're on the other side of the pond right now. And let me show you the dessert I made. Hopefully you can see. Ooh, very nice, crepes. Strawberry fell down, but here it is anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so Looks I made some Hungaria Palacinta, as we call it, on the other side. Uh, and uh, in English or in America, they call it crepes. But in Hungary, for the longest time, we only thought it's a Hungarian thing, palacinta. So I filled some of them with Nutella cream, which I love. Mm. And the others I filled with the peach jam. So I look forward to having them later with my family. In the former Yugoslavia, I remember cooking palacinka with a kind of a raspberry jam. It was so delicious. And Sophia, welcome to Desserts with the Polgar. Hello. Great to be here. Wow. It's been a while since the four of us saw each other um, exactly. in Rio. And it's, it's great to have this uh, technology to, to help us come together once again. It's fantastic. And what have you made for your dessert? Well, I did a traditional Hungarian dessert. I always have in the freezer, uh, bringing it from Hungary, it's uh, chestnuts. Chestnut cream with whipped cream, a little bit of strawberries on top. It's just the best thing ever. You can't imagine. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds great. Looks great, too. And hello, Judith. Nice to see you, too. What have you made for your dessert? Hi, it's great to be here with you. And I made a tiramisu. You can see it here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And actually, this is what I've learned during the quarantine in March. <laughs> How to make when, tiramisu. Yes, exactly. I loved it uh, all along. But now I decided to make it for my family, especially with the, the, to my son and my husband. They really love sweets. And there was a great success, and then continuously every day I had to make it, so I got the practice to do it well. Right. I don't think I showed you mine. Mine, it, it, it's it's kind of crumbly. I like I like it with the crumbles and the vanilla, and I put some pecan uh, pecans as well. But two dollars, yeah. two scoops of vanilla ice cream, and the aroma is fantastic. I tell you, it's just the best. It's, it's, it's the best. It's, it's ridiculous. Uh, I'm fighting for equality already with my wife. <laughs> She's fast. She's fast. It's amazing. It's amazing. It really reminds me of the, of 
the team tournaments that we used to play in Hilversum in Holland. Yes. Every time we got to Holland, it, it was uh, like the first thing we would get, the, the traditional Dutch apple pies. Mm. Yeah. Very nice. <laughs> Uh, before we uh, uh, came on, we thought about some of the topics that we would like to talk about. And the amazing thing is all of you were homeschooled. And now with the lockdown and quarantine, more and more and more people are doing home study, uh, online school. And in a very strange way, all of you have gone into education and chess being uh, your curriculum, if you will. And Susan, if I could start with you and the subject of education for a moment, you are a university uh, coach and your teams at Webster University have been fantastic. Uh, talk to us a little bit about your background with education and how you found yourself drawn into this line of the chess world. Well, I, I have uh, been born into a family of two educators, so I always maybe inherited in my genes uh, that passion for teaching and sharing knowledge, and I really enjoy uh, teaching. Uh, my first students were my sisters when they were much younger, and uh, I spent countless hours with them, teaching them chess as well as some other things. So it just came so natural to me. First, I had my chess center in New York City, which ran for 13 years once I moved to the US. But then I started SPICE, standing for Susan Polgar Institute for Chess Excellence, uh, first at Texas, and then after five years, the program moved to Webster University, where we're still at today. In our ninth year of the program, we had unprecedented success, winning uh, 61 national and world titles, our students did obviously, either as individual or team uh, victories. And uh, well, it, it's a wonderful opportunity, I think, for students, as you know, Yasser, especially here in, in the United States, it has been a big challenge for a lot of teenagers that were in high school and they were trying to look into what to do after high school, whether to go to a professional career or try to stay in chess and make a living. And for the great majority of them, unless they were super good like yourself, uh, basically they had no choice but to get a professional career if they wanted to make a decent living. And uh, the beautiful thing is that now with programs like Webster University, when uh, universities offer scholarships that cover basically all the tuition and fees and for top players even uh, uh, accommodation uh, allowance, allowance, uh, it, it's a great opportunity to continue with their chess development in an environment that we provide them with, a, as, as you visited, I think, uh, a wonderful uh, building that uh, is dedicated to chess with a library of close to a thousand different titles with the desktop computers where they can do research uh, in their openings or practice with, and most importantly, perhaps uh, having uh, regular training uh, with the team. So we, we meet usually several times a week, obviously some slightly different now in, in COVID times, but, uh, and also that they have each other. Like currently Webster has nine grandmasters uh, on the team and uh, it's a wonderful opportunity to, for them to have a constant training camp and it's only up to them how much they take advantage of it. Wow, well, sounds absolutely fantastic. And for you, uh, Sophia, even though it's not like you're the educator, you actually went into the graphic, graphic arts and arts. And for Judith's uh, chess curriculum, you actually supplied a lot of the graphics. Tell us about your background in chess education and how you came to become a graphics artist? Well, um, obviously I too was a competitive player for many, many years. I started to play when I was four years old. And after about uh, 20 some years of uh, competitive chess, um, when I moved to Israel, I gradually started playing less. 
Uh, and then at some point we moved to Canada for three years uh, because of my husband's um, work as a doctor. And uh, I happened to have uh, more time at home with the kids. No tournaments, obviously. Mm -hmm. and, and I was teaching them how to play chess, my own sons. I was also giving at that time uh, private lessons, both online and, uh, and uh, in the neighborhood. I gave uh, lessons in schools, in smaller groups. And I actually liked it a lot. Uh, I thought it was it was really really nice to to pass on the knowledge to the younger generation, and I really liked the interaction with the with kids. Uh, and then later on, when Judith started the, her mm -hmm. uh, fellows program, which is for um, uh, uh, for elementary school children, and later uh, uh, we also did the the chess playground, which is for preschoolers. It was just a joy to to work together with teachers and um, and sort of uh, create a magical world for children uh, with rhymes and uh, and uh, drawings and illustrations. And it was a process. Um, to me, it was pure joy to, to be part of it. And, and when I see kids like on some of the uh, global chess festivals when I meet the kids mm. and they come up to me and they say, I, you know, I'm, I was drawing this, this queen, I was trying to make it like the one you have in the book. And um, it, it, it's just amazing. I, I really, really like that, that kind of work. That sounds so joyful indeed. And Judith, finally we come to you and tell us how you make the transition from world-class grandmaster to educator and curriculum developer. Uh, well, actually, it's not going to be surprising what I'm going to say. I think that I started to get involved in uh, developing a program when my kids became a, in a kindergarten age. Oliver was something five or six. And uh, I started to feel that I want to have chess in his life also. And then uh, Sophia was far away, so I also thought that it would be so great to talk with her not only for fun weekly but to somehow tighten the discussions and talks every day so i asked her to to make the graphics of the program and then uh, you know how it is when you're passionate about something you you start with something very small you know that it has great potentials and then you start developing it and then you see oh this is good this we can pull in into the curriculum and that is great and then i'm meeting up with uh, with teachers with psychologists with other people who are uh, involved in the in the teaching and then you start seeing it that really how much different things you can use with chess to give to the kids for their everyday life. I mean, obviously, uh, the coordinates and the black and white and the 64 squares, and we developed uh, the pieces, what uh, originally was drawn by Sophie, the pieces, we have our own characters in the educational program. We developed different tools, extra plays, toys, cards, chess domino, everything, rhymes, songs, and then you know how it is like you you work on your opening in the night or if you say okay you play f4 and the deeper you go the more you know about it you more discover and you have more and more and more ideas mm -hmm. and of course the team was very passionate of course it was fantastic for me that sophie was taking uh, the the journey with me it was obviously we could call each other at midnight or 6 a.m whether depending how uh, the situation was and we had a very uh, fanatic team who were developing all this. We had, of course, piloted the program. And uh, by now we have about 40,000 kids uh, being involved in the program yearly. And uh, we are running it for since 2013. It became part of the national curriculum as an optional subject. And also with the preschoolers, we have the program running for three years already. We have nearly 2,000 uh, teachers who got the course 
education. So it is something special and uh, I really love that. This is one of the things what uh, my foundation is doing. And, uh, but I'm not teaching myself this program because this is for teachers. At the same time, uh, I also like to teach actually, even though I do very little. But uh, the most, uh, what I like, I think, to, to give a very posit positive vibes and motivation to the new generation, whether they are strong and competitive or they are not. But I think this is one of the most important, generally, to support kids uh, with uh, being in, with supportive words and uh, encourage them really try their best and do what they really want. But uh, I do want to see more adults supporting the kids mm -hmm. and giving all this uh, effort into them that, that do it, do it. But of course you, you have to work, you, do, you have to do other things. But uh, for me, it's important to, to give the motivation for the next generation. Wonderful. And uh, Susan, I'd like to just go to you for a quick second. Um, and say, you know, like there's a lot of studies that, you know, chess impacts kids and this and that and so forth. But uh, a lot of those studies get thrown out. They say, oh, they're too good. Uh, you know, the, the, the kids who play chess are like too better focused, too much better disciplined and stuff. But one thing, just an empirical observation that I've made about children who are exposed to chess, especially from the ages of say five to nine, is that somehow they're much more mature. It's like they're more focused, they're more aware, they're more respectful. Uh, just if you would speak a little bit of how you see chess impacting the lives of children of the five years to nine years. How? I think it's absolutely formative and life-changing. I think those habits that uh, little chess players, we all develop that at the beginning of our career, so to say, I think are amazingly important life skills, such as being able to focus on one thing, such as being patient, such as thinking first, moving after because of the touch-move rule, such as taking into account our opponent's plans and threats, and it's not just a solitaire game where we can do whatever we want. Uh, time management, and just to mention a few of those absolutely critical life skills that I think are absolutely transferable to any situation in life. I think it's, it's a great skill that kids can gain through chess, whether they end up taking it really seriously and try to be a professional player or not. Right. Same question to you, uh, Sophia. You see this group of kids who have been exposed to chess, who are even maybe passionate about it, versus a group of kids, same ages, five to nine, uh, differences that you pick up on. I believe every sport is very good and, and the mental sport, uh, such a mental sport as chess, uh, of course, gives all the things Susan just um, explained and, and many more. Um, but in every sport you have also the, the respect to, to your opponent and you know, you, you, you have to learn how to win in a, in a graceful manner, but also how to accept losing. So, so these are also, the sport elements are also very important uh, that, that you can practice from a very, very early age uh, near the, the, the chessboard. And I think the fact that uh, you sort of learn while playing uh, does the magic somehow. Mm, so, nice. yeah. And yeah, the obvious about, you know, calculating skills and, mm -hmm. and you know, um, uh, decision making and there are so many things that the kids really learn without realizing that they're learning. They're mm -hmm. just like, you know, so, so that's, mm -hmm. that's a really cool thing about chess. Um, chess and I, I think also other board games and sports, you know, I, I love chess, but it doesn't have to be that, uh, only chess. Uh, yeah. I think kids, kids that are engaged in sports and, uh, and games, and, and it's not only video games, but, you know, um, games where, where you actually have a connection with real people. 
uh, I think they're different than um, than other kids. They, they get more mature, as you said. Oh. Thank you for that, Sophia. For you, Judith, I'd like to change the question a little bit and not so much to say, you know, like how chess impacts children and maybe influences their mental processes, but I'll change the conversation to a little bit about fair play, that when we play uh, against one another, we shake hands, we're respectful and so forth and so on. Um, fair play and chess. And how does that build character? Uh, before I answer to that question, I have just two ideas I want to share connected to your sure. previous question. I think what Sophie highlighted, the game part, I would like to highlight even more that I think it's, it's very good for kids to play games and chess is a game. And also, I think what is it's extremely important to, to have tools for kids to keep their curiosity. Because once the kids still keep their curiosity, they are learning much faster, right? If you right. ask questions, if you learn how to ask a good question, you're halfway there in the learning process. So I, I just believe that it's very important. Fair play is also something which I felt during my career that it was something essential for me because... Uh, uh, obviously, I was very competitive and there were different stages in my life where uh, people were asking me why was I not doing this or that and I just felt that it would be unfair and uh, and I always felt that I could stay this way and, and this was my, uh, my main mindset that I want to win but not by any means, right? And right. I think this is very important for, uh, for all of us to show also for the next generation. And I like to highlight my favorite story, which happened a few months ago when Magnus Carlsen made his uh, tournament series. First of all, that was a very nice gesture for him that uh, during the lockdown, he made a five tournament series. And one of the, the story was that uh, they played mini matches against each other. And this time it was Magnus Carlsen against uh, Dingley Ren. And in game one, he was a little bit better in the rook hand game, but it was pretty clear that Dingley Ren would be making a draw, especially because uh, Magnus has huge respect for the world number three player. And, uh, but there was a disconnection of the internet because in China they have more uh, difficulties to, to get a right internet connection. And just a few minutes later, automatically the system gave the start of the next game, right? With having Magnus Carlsen elite 1-0. And it's very interesting how Magnus reacted. I think I've seen also your reaction, which uh, everybody was very surprised at life in live commentaries that practically Magnus took the first opportunity in move three to give up his queen. And after mm -hmm. Dingleran was taking it, he just resigned in order to continue the match from fair, equal uh, terms. And I felt that this is not something that anybody could advise Magnus or uh, it has to be coming naturally. It just, you just have it in your mind and, and you do this. And actually all this, what is it about fair play? It's kind of an intuition, it's a momentum where how do you react and how do you be a fair play player, right? And I think this was such an amazing way of, uh, of giving respect for the other players and then Magnus really wants to challenge himself and he says, no, he's the number three. I really want to show that I'm good on the board and not by winning because of internet connection. So I think uh, there are some great exemplary moves like this. Sophia, yourself as well, how do you see fair play and its role in chess? And do you have such a, a marvelous example as the one that Judith just cited? Um, actually, I, I don't remember anything, um, you know, extreme. Uh, like, yeah, th this story that Judith just shared is, uh, is probably the fir first time. Of uh, someone, you know, returning the um, uh, the point because of, um, of of the loss of an internet connection. Also, when I used to play, internet was wasn't part of the game yet. Um, uh, but I think in general, um, fair play is important, and most players do play fair. 
Yeah, I don't know, Susan, you have any any stories? No, about I like it uh, my, my motto has been for many years now, begin with grace, lose with dignity. And I definitely educate all my students in that spirit as well. And uh, I just would like to mention one little story that uh, happened uh, two years ago, that uh, after the Spice teams have won seven final four championships in a row, in the two years ago in the final four, we were one move away from winning our eights. And uh, one of our team members put his rook one square away from the winning move with a fear that both h7 or h8 didn't matter where he goes with the rook, it goes really easily. And apparently, again, he picked the wrong one of the two and the opponent escaped by a miracle and therefore we are our uh, series of winning stopped after seven years and uh, it was trust me one of the more painful moments in my life being so close and deservingly winning and yet we didn't and it's sports it's life it happens but yet i was the first one to go and congratulate the other team's coach who won the championship and uh, it's just a matter of uh, good sportsmanship as painful as it is uh, losing out I have one story of sportsmanship that I like very much. It was from a Phillips and Drew tournament, a classical tournament in London. And Lubomir Lavoyevich was playing against Jonathan Spielman, and he had a rook as white on, let's say, A8. <clears throat> and he has a rook as white on H1, and he plays the move rook on A8 to H8 with the immediate threat of rook on H1 to h7 checkmate and uh, spielman is probably losing after rook h8 but somehow as this rook was sliding uh, across the board there might have been <laughs> some syrup <laughs> on the g8 square so it only went like halfway between g8 and h8 so uh lubo uh adjusted the rook to the h8 square fully because it was halfway in between pressed the clock the arbiter stuart rubin stepped in and put the rook back on g8 <laughs> and said continue and lugo said no no no, no. The rooks on h8 no says the arbiter the rooks on g8 i only allow you to continue with the rook on g8 but with the rook on g8, there's only one move. King takes g8. There's no other move. It's a it, it's the only move in the position. So with the move, king takes g8. Spielman wins on the spot. It's like it's over. And no, Lubo is arguing that he wanted rook h8. And Jonathan uh, puts the rook on h8, but the arbiter wouldn't allow Jonathan to do that. So now they're in an impasse, and Jonathan offers Lubo a draw, and the game was draw drawn. But it was the first time that the arb I saw the arbiter interfere with what both players agreed, mm -hmm. right? Both players agreed the rook wanted to go to h8 and not g8. The arbiter insisted that it land on g8, and that would have meant the end of the game, and so the game was drawn. So I, I always thought of that as a, a really nice example of fair play, and I, I, I thought that was really good. A recent example of fair play, if you will. Um, recently, there was the online chess Olympics, okay? And there is like a quarterfinals or semifinals where Armenia player disconnected and um, Armenia lost those games and lost the match. They essentially forfeited the match as the disconnection was counted as a forfeit. Then we come to the gold medal uh, round, uh, the finals, and two Indian players disconnect. Uh, apparently there was some kind of a global outage and since one of them was winning, the other one was drawing, um, uh, the FIDE president decided to award both teams 
the gold medal, and it was a very controversial decision. It's one thing, uh, Judith, when you just gave this wonderful example of Magnus as the individual, right? He wants to play individually a good uh, sportsman. But now it's the team, the whole team, and a lot of the Russian players were upset and so on. It ended in a great deal of controversy. If I could ask you, Judith, what did you think? Did the FIDE president make the right decision? I think it's very important to know the whole story. And um, I don't think I have the whole story, all the sides. And I think in this situation, it's also important uh, communication is essential. And it's also essential to know what are the time frames, when, what happened, and who reacted, how, how did the arbiter reacted on the situation? When did the players realize that there was this connection? who got what information from the Russian team, from the Indian team. So it's, a, and it's a new thing, right? It's a completely new situation, which we were not dealing with before. And it's extreme, extremely sensitive. So obviously it's clear that the president of FIDE and his team made a mistake not having the best rules possible to exclude something like this. Uh, I have full respect for the Russian team and for the Indian team because I think they are great and they gave the dedication and they were preparing, they really played as a team. They had some difficult moments beforehand with the internet connection, but they were really focusing, having extra backup of internet connection and so on. But I think in these kind of situations, I always say uh, to my kids and to everybody, it's not a problem if you make a mistake, but it's a big issue how you handle your mistake and how you want to correct it, right? And still, of course, it's extremely sensitive situation. Mm -hmm. And um, I was kind of uh, uh, upset with the decision by the president because I believe that chess and sport has to have a winner. Even though both teams really gave all in for like two weeks or something, and they had the tension, they were working together, they were keeping touch, Vidit was the, the captain and Motilev in the Russian team. So there is no question about it that both teams they really gave all in and, and everybody was fighting for the gold, right? That's, that's not a question. But that's how sport is that eventually, especially Olympiad, you have a winner. No matter how small, tiny, small thing will be the decisive, you have to have a winner, right? And there's only one who gets the gold and the other one the silver and the bronze, right? So from my sportive point of view, I would very much like to see a winner in the second place. I would, from the information I know, I would try to postpone it for a later stage to replay the games, which were disconnected. But of course, uh, I mean, it's, it's a very sensitive situation. And I think communication is, is, is one of the, or lack of communication or miscommunication, but this was very big part of the, of the decision what the, the FIDE president did. It's not, a, it's not a situation where I would like to be to this side, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, you would want to be the arbiter. <laughs> Your take on the, uh, on the controversial finish of the online chess Olympiad. Yeah, I largely agree with uh, Judith's uh, comments on it. And I think the, the key is that uh, this situation of serious online competitions is relatively new. And I think that the rules were not uh, clarified enough, perhaps, or not thought out the best they could. And uh, I think uh, because of lack of sufficient uh, experience on the organizational part, perhaps, or rulemaking parts with the online or internet chess for serious events that, like an Olympiad or such, uh, I think uh, it was a learning curve, let's say, and, uh, and obviously it was not an ideal outcome of what happened. Turning back to chess and education just for a moment, because there are thousands of coaches, really thousands of coaches out there who uh, teach what we like to call the five R's, right? Reading, you have to uh, read chess books and get ideas and writing. You have to write down your moves and there's arithmetic. You have to count the pieces. There's reasoning. 
If we don't move our queen, it's going to be captured. And there's responsibility, the five R's, if you will. If I can ask each of you, um, which R, Sophia, is the most important? <laughs> I would say, well, they all are, obviously, um, and, um, and you want to have them all, but maybe the most important, uh, I would say, is responsibility. Okay. If you can reach, uh, if, if you can teach a, a child to be responsible, chess is a great tool for that because really every move you make uh, has its uh, consequences. And you have to plan ahead. And um, uh, if you're responsible, then then it's easier to, to learn all the other things. Cool. And uh, Judith, which R is the most important? I would say reasoning, because uh, it's also connected for me with curiosity and discussion. And uh, I think it's very important that's how you can uh, improve yourself a lot by discussing things and you're making your own reasons. I remember when my, I was a child, sneaking into Susan's uh, living room when she was having a few minutes of break with the, the coach and then somehow I sneaked in and I was telling my story. I want to play this, look how good it is. And they were saying, no, 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 this is not so good. So I was reasoning and I was fighting for my right that uh, what I said, and uh, I think it's very important in the learning process. Okay, and uh, Susan, what are well, is the most important? My first two choices, uh, responsibility would be my first choice as well, because I think that's probably the most important lesson of the five that, uh, that chess teaches, I think, uh, because in life it's even more important than in a chess game to be responsible for our actions. And my second choice would be reasoning, as, as uh, Judith said, uh, because to have reasons for what we're doing, we're not just moving the pieces randomly, right? And just like in life, we shouldn't just do things randomly, but there should be a plan, there should be a reason why we're doing things. And uh, so I think those, those two would be definitely my first two picks. Right. Uh, for me, it was always that writing was underappreciated in the sense that when you write down your moves to my mind is like a connection between the actual act of writing your brain becomes ingrained with the moves you see patterns uh, you write down the move E4, and as you're writing down the move E4, it sort of like goes into your brain, this picture, the pawns landing on E4. When your opponent plays E5, when you're writing it down, uh, it, it seems to me that the act of writing hardwires you, and you remember more and uh, pattern recognition. So for me, writing was always undervalued, underappreciated. I'd like to change the conversation because we've been talking about educating and uh, education and fair play, and somehow you are, all of you are parents, but <laughs> none of us go to a school that says, you know, yeah. this is the university for better parenting. Um, <laughs> I, I need some uh, Polgar protocols. I'm going to start with you, Susan. Give me two rules that you independently created as a mommy um, as you were uh, raising your children. What two things did you do or learn for yourself? And you were very glad that it came to you. Well, I think uh, the first thing is it's really important for children to have structure in their life or have a routine in their lives. And as much as they may fight it or uh, not feel happy about it temporarily at the moment in some cases, I think they really appreciate it and they really need it. It's good for them. They want to know that, okay, that's the routine from eight to nine or nine to ten or, or certain routines and they appreciate it and they can count on it they know what to expect and and i think it is just essential in, in parenting and and i think the other part that's really important is to find the right balance between showing your love and affection to your children and discipline so just because you love them and and uh, 
you know, care for them a lot, it doesn't mean as a parent that you should allow them to do whatever they want just because they throw a tantrum or, or they don't feel like getting out of bed or, uh, you know, eating their vegetables or whatever it may be, right? Mm -hmm. So it's really important to find the right balance between that. And sometimes it's hard because you don't feel good when your child cries or complains, uh, but but yet it's necessary. Interesting. And uh, Sophia, for you, two uh, principles, protocols that uh, we could all use to help our children? Well, um, I'm probably not going to say anything new. I mean, it's a subject that was um, discussed so many times, but probably what I find most important is to give a, a good example, to set a good example for, for your children. Because what I've noticed is many times we're trying to educate them uh, on one thing, but then we ourselves do something different, then they're just going to copy us, the parents. We're so influential in, in, in their lives that mm -hmm. the, probably the best thing you can do is, um, is be a good example. Like one of the quotes I, I read and I really liked about uh, being a good father and uh, someone said that, well, it, love the mother, you know, just g give a good example of, of loving the mother and in a loving family, you'll, you're going to have a, a good educated kid. Um, but also another thing is probably, you know, there are no perfect parents. We all want the best for our kids. I mean, my parents were exceptional and they were teachers, so they probably could do it in a different level than most people can. Um, every parent wants the best. Uh, but they all need also help. Like, you know, my father couldn't coach us in chess, let's say, after a certain, uh, um, like, six or seven years old, we would be better already than him. So he would get coaches. Or, you know, not every parent is a math teacher. You you get that private lesson or counseling uh, or psychological help, whatever. My point is, uh, it's okay to get help. I mean, no one has to be the perfect parent. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's, it's okay to get help. I like that. And uh, Judith, uh, for you, what two parenting skills are you particularly proud that you help develop? Well, I generally believe that uh, to give attention and be in the presence when you spend the time with your kid, I think this is maybe the most important. And in our life, this is uh, at the same time so difficult because we are all so busy. And sometimes we may think that the, the problem or the issue which is happening with the kid, ah, that's not important. Everything is important because what is important for him or her, you really have to give your time and attention because even if it's not so much time and as they grow, they don't even want your attention so much. Maybe it's only five minutes, 15 minutes or just a sentence or a question, but it's very important to be there, right there and focusing, looking into their eyes. I think this would be one of the things which I consider that it's essential. And they can also appreciate it, and, and this way they are also going to be more honest and they know they can count on you. And uh, the other one, uh, I always, especially as my kids are older already, Hannah is 14 and Oliver is 16, I, uh, I start to believe more in uh, not to solve their problems, but to give them a hand, like uh, not to give them the fish cooked and baked with spices, but to give them that and give them the opportunity and uh, to teach them how to fish. And uh, I think uh, this is important that you have to give them all the help you can, but don't serve them the ready things. They have to develop it by themselves. Nice. Uh, this has been like the fastest program ever, but I really did want to get in one last question for yourselves before we wrap things up, desserts with the Polgar sisters. Uh, always, I think all of us have always been asked uh, the question time and time again, 
how do I get better at chess? What do I have to do to get better at chess? What should I read? How much time should I study? And instead of answering that question, I'd like to, to make a little twist on the question. And I'd like to ask yourselves, um, what human qualities does a person need to become a very good chess player? Uh, Sophia, can I start with you? Two qualities uh, that a player needs. I would say probably passion for the game uh, and, uh, and diligence. You know, like you can be the most talented player and you can have uh, lots of passion for the game and you have the best coaches. Uh, but the mileage you have to do yourself, you have to put on, put in that certain amount of work in order to to um, make your talent uh, shine and then uh, turn it into winning points on the chessboard. Very nice. And uh, Susan, two qualities, two human qualities that a person needs to become a successful player. Well, definitely, uh, to, to Sophia mentioned that very important. In fact, one of them was on my in my thoughts uh, for this question as well. Uh, well, I think uh, self control is a really important one for a chess player because many times we have the temptation to make a move quickly or without double checking it or calculating deep enough or just go with that intuition and yet it's important to have that inner voice tell us let me double check that make sure it's the right sacrifice at the right time for example and and the other one i think is uh, the fighting spirit to have good power and, and uh, the determination to try to win great and uh, judith you get the final word on this question <laughs> what two human qualities really are important to be uh, a good chess player? I believe perseverance is something essential, whatever you do. But of course, if you want to be a uh, high uh, rating or, or good chess player, it is essential, especially in chess that uh, you have to go on studying lines or even in end games or whatever you do. If you really want to get results, perseverance is, ex is uh, exceptionally important, I believe. And also to have the, the character for a competitive sport. It's also essential because I think this was the strongest part of me that I, I was a character of a competitor and uh, definitely gives a lot to be successful. Wonderful. Well, uh, what can I say? Uh, I want to do this in person next time. <laughs> <laughs> I want to try your desserts as well. <laughs> I have the feeling that I would be even happy only to smell your apple pie because those... <laughs> it's quite Great. true. It really is so tempting. It really is. So I just want to say thank you all uh, for making the time uh, for desserts with the Polgar sisters. It's been a pleasure. Thank, thank you, you very much. much. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs>